we're talking about increase, we're talking about uh, the applications and principles of growth. And that's what I'm going to be focused on all this year. I'm going to be I'm going to be teaching. I was teaching on Tuesday on some more practical applications of growth. And uh, we're going to be doing that because I'm after a group of people this year. I'm not after everybody. I'm not after the multitudes. I'm after people who want to grow, who are willing to grow, and who understand the benefit of growth. Kingdom judgment starts in the house of God. How many of us have heard that so many times? Judgment starts in the house of God. We're going to look at that today in the spirit of and in the context of growth. Matthew 7, 3 says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. This is a powerful question. Jesus was a master at asking very deep and very powerful questions uh, that would provoke you to sit and think about your answer. Why do you look at the moat, the splendor, that is in thy brother's eye, but consider is not the beam that is in your own eye. Or how wilt thou say to your brother, ain't this sound like the saints? How, how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the moat out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Then he said, that's hypocritical. It is hypocritical because the first responsibility and the priority of your life is to cast the beam out of your own eye. And then you shall see clearly to cast out the moat out of your brother's eye. Jesus asked this question because he understands that as long as your attention is fixing other folk, you will lose the responsibility to fix yourself. It, it, he, he talks about people who are consumed with everybody else's business, but don't handle their own business. He's talking about people who are always looking in your backyard when their backyard look like Sanford and Son. It's, he's talking about people who live in glass houses that take joy in throwing stones at others. Jesus uses this analogy to help us to understand the fallacy of those people who fail to spend time working to be self-aware self-examining and judging oneself. I am going to keep saying it and I'm going to build on it all year long. You can get sick of me if you want to, but I'm going to keep pushing the envelope. Jesus is dealing with the fallacy of people who spend time, uh, who fail to spend time working on themselves. If you're going to grow spiritually, you cannot afford to spend time fixing other folk. You got to work on fixing yourself. So number one, you have to become self-aware. There are so many people that are not self-aware. Uh, number two, self-examining. Once you are aware or once you become aware, then you have to examine that which you find and fix and work on bringing it into alignment with its truth. And then we need to judge ourselves. Now, if you're going to grow, you're going to be an expert. And if you become an expert in becoming self-aware, self-examining, and judging yourself, you will find out you're so consumed with the mess that's in your life 
and correcting it and growing and becoming what you need to be, that you will have very little, if no time, always trying to be an expert on somebody else. You cannot, and I said this before in a message, you do not have the skill sets, experience, and expertise to turn around and evaluate someone else. You cannot appraise other folk because you don't have the tools to appraise them. You can't, you don't, you, you, for me to do a proper appraisal, I have to have certain knowledge, certain information, certain facts, certain discovery, and a proper assessment of the information that I get. I think about people all the time on their way. They get, they get jacked up by the police and they end up in jail. And right away, everybody starts saying, they guilty. I know they did it. They need to put them under the jail. But as time goes on and evidence comes forth and information comes forth, the very person they said was guilty was not guilty at all. So many times people become guilty based on public opinion. But how many know public opinion don't mean nothing in the court of law? We are quick to say who's right, who's wrong, who's guilty, who's not guilty, and make assessments from the bleachers. No expertise. No, no, you ain't been to school. You don't know nothing. You just assume by what you observe. And your observation is biased. Your observation is hinged on your own issues. Your observation is, is, is you don't have the skill sets. In, in federal cases, um, when a person is brought in to be dealt with, in federal cases, they know the feds ain't coming to get you until they got you. They ain't going to see, see, state, they'll come get you put you in handcuffs, throw you in jail, and, won't even, and, and, and find out if you're guilty later. Feds don't do that. Feds done got all the information. They got pictures. They got voicemails. They got, they, got, they got it wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up. By the time they come get you, if the feds ever come get you, just go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to give you grace to get through it. And then the judge has experts. And the experts just don't deal with the, 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 the issue at hand. They deal with the psychological, the way you were raised, the home that you came up in, traumas that you went through, things that happen in your life that bring you to the place that you're now at. They just don't say they did it. No, they go back to your history. They go talk to your neighbors. They go talk to your parents. They go talk to friends. They go all the way back to your teachers. They still alive. They do a whole case. It's called casework. They work up the case from expertise, different expertise. Go over the, your life with a too fine tooth and a, a fine comb to come up with the judge's capacity to make a proper judgment. It takes months to work up a case, but you can judge somebody on a whim. You ignorant as a doorknob. You don't have all the facts. Hello? When did Facebook become the Bible? When did Twitter become the Bible? When did Fox and CNN become the Bible? You are basing your biases and opinions off of somebody else's information, and many times it's lopsided, many times it's, it's twisted, many times it's spins put on it. I, was, I remember I was talking to a military agent, and I got to move on, and he was saying, uh, what y'all see on CNN, CNN and what's actually happening are two different stories. But, but you see people going to fighting over what they see on the news. You believe everything you read without having any knowledge, 
whatsoever of what the truth is. And if anybody is guilty of making people guilty before you can prove innocent, it's church. Y'all don't, y'all don't even follow the Constitution. Guilty. Guilty. Gossip guilty. Y'all ain't going to hear me. Y'all will hang and destroy somebody and call somebody guilty and then dumb enough to say, I felt that in my spirit. People who spend their time on issues of others therefore fail to work on their own deficiencies and problems. Jesus expresses that. It is hypocritical when you are an expert on others, what others need and do, but do not and are not attempting to be self-aware. Oftentimes, people fall into one of four categories. Number one, introspection. Know who they are, but don't ask for feedback or explore blind spots. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down because you. I want to know which category you fall into. You, you, you know who you are, but you don't ask for feedback or you don't explore blind spots. Everybody has blind spots. I'm going to say that. Everybody has blind spots. Everybody should embrace feedback. I'm going to deal with that later on. I ain't got time this morning. I really want to get in it. Number two, people who are aware. They know who they are and they value feedback. They, see, they know who they are, but they value feedback. They value intelligent, wise, and people who they can trust to give them feedback. They, they are self-aware. They know who they are, but they still are open to constructive criticism. The problem with most church folk, you know who you are. I know who I am in Christ, but nobody can give you feedback. You're not open to constructive criticism. You're not open to anybody speaking into your blind spot. But somebody who is, wants to be aware and want, somebody who wants to be whole and somebody who wants to be secure in their identity and have their identity anchored in a, a solid foundation, they value feedback. I'm amazed at how many people are now that I'm counseling and dealing with from all over the country who are experts in their field. Very intelligent people, people who got it going on, but yet they seek out help for their blind spots. You know why some of us can't get nowhere? We'll never be successful in life because we let who we think we are fool us. And we don't, we're not intentional about reaching out to somebody to help us. You ain't talking to me. I'm talking about people who uh, have six figures. I'm, I'm talking uh, more. I'm talking about people who are experts in their field. I'm talking about people who are more intelligent to, than me, but they got sense enough to understand if they're going to continue to grow and be the best they can be, they need somebody they can trust to speak to the blind spot. See, the problem with the church, we think we see so much that we're blind and the blind is trying to lead the blind and all of them falling into a ditch. The seeker, they don't know who they are and they don't even understand how they are perceived of others. They don't have a clue of their identity. They don't have a clue of their uh, value and personal equity. Uh, and they don't have a clue about, they, are, they, they shape, they sh uh, what you call them, they're shapeshifters. They're chameleons. They just go with the flow and they just become who you need them to be at the moment because they don't even know who they are. 
They don't stand for nothing. They don't have principles. They're not attached to certain innate values that they have possessed. They don't have, they don't have a system they work in. They don't, they don't create habits that keep them productive and growing. People who are seekers don't, don't they're seeking, uh, but they don't know uh, how to engage. They're not willing to pay the price to set in place disciplines and systems in their life that will guarantee or support the success that they say they want. They don't know who they are. The pleaser, overly focused on how they are perceived. The pleaser is always out there trying to look good and impress people all the time without any sense of their own identity. They are so thirsty and hungry to be accepted by other people that they live their lives as a joke and as, as an illusion. You will never meet the real them because they will always show you their representative. Which one are you? Are you that one that knows or think you know who you are but you don't ask for feedback you don't explore a blind spot? Are you the one that know who you are and you value the feedback of others? Are you a seeker that you don't know who you are but, or how you're perceived? You can think you got it going on and everybody's saying, that's a dummy. Are you a pleaser? Someone who is truly self-aware are not just aware of what their strengths are, but they work to be as aware of their weaknesses as their strengths. People that are growth-seeking people don't just harp on their strengths, but they're clear and accepting and real about their weaknesses. They are clear about the threats they face and the oppositions to their success. They understand where their opportunities exist. Uh, in the... Uh, in the academia world, this is called uh, SWOT analysis, the ability to uh, be self-aware, to identify strengths, identify weaknesses, see threats to your growth, and to know where opportunities exist. It takes a mature person to come to the place where they're, number one, aware of their strengths, number two, are clear about their weaknesses. Number three, they know where the threats are, right? They know where they can go and where they can't go. Hello. They know their limits. Hello. They know they ain't got no business over there. They're aware of their threats, and they also are capable of seizing opportunity. Romans 14 and 9 says, For the end of Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. That Christ himself in his excellence and in his work as redeemer is Lord both of dead and the living. But why does you, why dost thou judge thy brother? Paul asked. Who gave you the authority to judge another man's servant? Who gave you the right? Or why dost thou still set at naught thy brother? Why do you feel like you are the one? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul asked the question, why dost thou Judge thy brother, for it is written, as I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow. You ain't got to worry about it. And every tongue shall confess uh, to God that Christ himself died, rose, revived, and he alone has the final say over the heart conditions of man. He alone will stand before, we will all stand for him, before him by ourselves. And we're going to give an account. See, we don't want to be accountable but now, but we're going to be accountable one day. 
We don't want to be, uh, we don't want to deal with accountability. We don't want to be accountable to ourselves. We don't want to be accountable to others. We want to do what we want to do, how we want to do it, when we want to do it, and, and, and this is me and this, but the Bible says before it's all over, every man and woman, boy and girl is going to stand before the judgment Christ of God. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue shall confess and God to God and give an account. Now you might not, you might not feel like you need to be accountable for your attendance. You may not feel like you need to be accountable for your prayer life. You may not feel like you need to be accountable for your service to God. But one day, as sure as I'm standing here, and my daddy used to say, as sure as you live and die, you're going to stand before God and you're going to answer. And you're not going to get away with your excuses. You're not going to be able to lie. You're not going to be able to say the Spirit told me. You're not going to be able to blame somebody where the pastor didn't do this, where sister so-and-so hurt my feelings. You're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account for all the deeds done in your body. Those of us who feel that we're not willing to hold ourselves accountable nor willing to be accountable will stand before God. You're going to do it one day. You may not bow. See, I don't want that. I'm going to bow my knee now. I'm going to confess now. I'm going to serve now. When I'm going to mess up, I'm going to be accountable and say, God, I messed up. I did wrong. Forgive me. I'm going to be accountable now so that I won't have a problem being accountable when I stand before the judgment seat of God. It's not that I did everything right. It's not that I crossed every T. It's not that I never made mistakes, but I am accountable. It means you take responsibility. I'm not blaming the devil. I'm not blaming God. I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And many of us are not accountable. We don't even take responsibility. We don't even know we sin. We don't even acknowledge we sin. We think that what we're doing today uh, in this life that we're living, where we live, love pleasures more than we love God, we think we're okay. We think everything is smooth. We think we got it going on. But baby, you gonna give account someday. If you don't do it in this earth, you're gonna do it in the judgment. Hallelujah. I'm going to try to get it right now, y'all. I, I, I don't need nobody standing over me. I'm trying to get it right. Lord, you know my heart. Lord, you know my mind. You know my goings out and my comings in. I can't fool you, Lord. I can't hide from you, Lord. I stand before you naked. You know all my inconsistencies. You know all my flaws. You know all my failures. I can't lie to you, God. And I'm standing here snowing and trusting that your grace and mercy is still available to me that even in the midst of my worst time I can come boldly before the throne of grace in my time of need and get the grace and mercy that I need to continue to stay right with you to continue to live a life consistent with my heart that is right before you God I can't hide I'm not trying to hide I'm not trying to uh, uh, get over I'm not trying to get by. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. You know my risings and you know my sitting down. You know my every thought. You know my every feeling. I'm so glad that I serve a God that's not like others, but he is a great high priest because he can be touched with the feelings of my infirmities. I'm glad I serve a God that I can go to without shame or guilt. I don't have to go with my head hung down because I'm going before a God that knows exactly how I feel. I'm serving a God that knows what it feels like to hurt, to be betrayed. It, I'm serving a God that knows what it feels like to cry and go through difficult times. I'm serving a God to know what it means to be strong in the spirit. Uh, but the flesh is weak. Jesus said the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And so we got to understand we are going to give an account. And guess what? You better do it now and not have to fall on your knees and give it later because if you wait till later, 
later, I don't think it's going to turn out too good for you because now is the time to get your house in order. Now is the time to stop playing games. Now is the time to stop trying to trick people and, and playing church and playing like you got it together. Now is the time. If there's ever been a time before for you to start sweeping out your own closet, getting your mind right, and stop playing these church games because guess what? The game will be over when you shut your eyes and open your eyes in eternity. You ain't going to be able to run. You ain't going to be able to lie. You're not going to be able to hide. Ain't nobody studying you. Ain't nobody impressed with you. You're going to stand before God for yourself. So then everyone shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore, he says, no, since you're going to be accountable to God, let us therefore judge not, therefore judge one another anymore. Mind your business. Get on the altar for yourself. Make your worship personal. Hello, somebody. I'm sick of praise and worship leaders who get up and beg everybody else to pray. And then when it's their time, they sitting down there like they're a celebrity. Ain't nobody, you know, you, you, if you're a worshiper, you ain't worshiping, you ain't entertaining people. You're supposed to be a worshiper. You, and if you ain't worshiping Monday through Friday, sit down on Sunday. Oh, Y'all ain't going to hear me. No man want to hear that, that, that unanointed, raggedy stuff you're doing. If you ain't got a song in your heart in the morning, if you ain't worshiping all week, if you ain't praying, don't come in here messing us up. Amen. Amen. If you ain't praying, if you ain't worshiping, if you ain't got no word life, who you going to minister to? You can't lead people where you ain't going. That's worship leaders, that's deacons, elders, ministers, whoever you are, you can't lead people where you're not going. It, how in the devil you going to lead people in a charge and you let the people run ahead of you? You got to lead the people. You got to lead them into the house of God. You got to lead them into service. You got to lead them into worship. You got to lead them into prayer. You got to lead them. Amen. You, you're supposed to be the captain, and you're standing up there shaking, and then the enemy coming, and then you're going to tell the soldiers, y'all go ahead, I'll be on. That's what we look like in the church. You're supposed to be a leader. Y'all go ahead, I, I'll catch up with you. And you up there hiding in the ditches like David's men were when Goliath was standing on a mountain speaking great uh, and tragic things again. You got to leave from the front. When are we going when, when to get the Holy Ghost and fire? When, when are we going to get Holy Ghost guts? When are we going to really step up and be champions for the kingdom of God? You can't be a champion if you're always uh, uh, getting away and getting out of it. You remind me of the Wizard of Oz. Everybody thought he was some big, great thing that he could give you a heart, that he could do all these things, he could give you a mind. And and when it all ended up, and y'all excuse my expression, at the end of the day when they ripped that Tito went back there and ripped that curtain, he was a little midget. And that's some of us, we are just great wizards. Most Christian people are just wizards. You know how to put the smoke screens up. You know how to manipulate the things so that people think you are somebody. And oh, they, isn't she just a marvelous Christian? Isn't he just a marvelous Christian? And you ain't hidden on the salt under the table. You're flaky. You're inconsistent. You're shallow. You cry. You can't take nothing, can't go through nothing. You're always complaining. It's everybody else but you. Therefore, let us judge. Y'all ready for me to move? I'm going to move. Let us not, therefore, judge one another anymore, but judge this, that no man puts a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in a brother's way. Instead of you worrying about judging somebody, how about you Worrying about you conducting yourself in a way that does not hinder the testimony of Jesus Christ. Does not mean uh, that you, you, we ought to be, uh, instead of us worrying about uh, judging somebody else, are we walking right? 
Are, are we being the leader we want others to be? Are we doing the things that we expect out of others? Instead of you worrying about judging other folk, he says you ought to worry about the conduct in your life, the discipline in your life that keeps you from being a hindrance to other people that's trying to find Christ. In other words, he said, while you judging other folks, you a stumbling block. You, you all up in the way, keeping other people from coming in. You, you, you're a stumbling block, an occasion to fall in your brother's way. I know that I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if a brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy him not with thy meat for he for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. He says you need to be mature enough to understand that our focus should not be on becoming a stumbling block to others who may be weak in the faith. Now let me straighten something out now. Because the, the weakness in others does not mean that you have to be condemned in your liberty. Your liberty as a mature Christian is yours, but you should not use that as a stumbling block or to allow yourself to live in an undisciplined way where others may have opportunities to fail. In other words, you ought to be disciplined enough that everything ain't for everybody. Do you not know, uh, Do you, you don't know to be wrong based on your level of maturity, but you have the capacity to, to offend others by your action. As a mature person, it is our responsibility to conduct ourselves in ways that do not offend the conscience of others. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Paul says in our Christian walk, there are some things that are not necessarily sin to you, but if, they are, if it affects the conscience of somebody else, then you should be mature enough to sustain for the benefit of others. In other words, if what I'm doing is going to offend you, then I may discipline myself as not to offend you. Not that I'm doing anything wrong, but guess what? If I do it in a way that it offends you intentionally, that's wrong. You understand what I'm saying? That's what, you, and this this loose stuff we got going on in the church. You just all out there on Facebook, just letting it all hang out. Keep your booty pictures off the Facebook. Amen. If you go on a vacation and you want your booty to hang out, keep your booty between you and where it is you going. Stay on Facebook with your booty. You done showed everybody your booty, now you're in church. Now, it won't nothing wrong with you going to get a suntan, but you ought to have sense enough to understand certain things belong in certain places. If you got to go to the bathroom, you don't go to the bathroom in the living room where everybody can see you and smell you. At least if you're going to poop, put it somewhere and put some, some on it. Am I preaching good? Because some of us done got arrogant and cocky. We just let it all hang out. You in church trying to show folks, you say, and then you on Facebook at a party looking like you crazy with some kind of cup in your head and your eyes looking like they about to pop out your head and, and, and then you're back in church talking about, I shut no, 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 no. Hello? If you ain't got sense enough not to destroy your life, please don't destroy somebody else. Don't let your liberty, oh, y'all not hear me. Don't let your liberty become a stumbling block to somebody else who's not in a place mentally, spiritually, or emotionally to deal with you. I tell people, y'all mad with me, yeah? I tell people all the time, there's poop everywhere. But that's why you got a system that knows how to deal with the waste. A lot of us don't have no waste management skills. We just pooping all over everybody, everything, and we just, well, I'm saying, I don't care what you say about me. 
I don't care what you say about me. I know Jesus. I know Jesus. Y'all, can, I can minister while I'm, you know, I'm tight, but I know Jesus. I know Jesus. Hey, y'all. Maturity says, even if you think you have the liberty, everything is not expedient. Hello, somebody. And there's a certain way that you need to conduct yourself. So in Romans 14, 10, the message Bible says, so where does this leave you when you criticize a brother? And when does that leave you when you are con- condescend to a sister? I say it leaves you looking pretty silly or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling before God. In 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, 31, it says, For we should judge ourselves. For if we should judge ourselves, if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned of the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, tar- eat and tarry one for another, then if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you shall come together not unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Paul illustrates around the Lord's table the necessity of self-judgment. He says, if you are uh, smart enough and mature enough to judge yourselves, then you keep yourselves outside of the judgment of others. Even if they run in their mouth, judge yourself. In other words, what I'm telling you, if I judge myself here on earth, if I do and, and, and examine myself here on earth, then I don't, I don't have to be judged with the fallen angels. If I do it now, when I get before God, guess what? I can face his judgment because I took care of my own judgment. He said, judge yourself that you shall not be judged. And even when God finds you in error, it is his love that chastens you. In other words, we we forgot that God's love chastens us. It corrects us. It only brings us not to condemn us, but to help us correct and align ourselves with his will and his purpose. Paul is clear that the act of communion is a time of reassessment. I love communion of our lives and the relationship we have with God. Paul says this is a time where we come to God and in the midst of coming to God, we have a chance to get it up. We have the chance to reconcile what we have not reconciled since the last communion. It reminds us that there we need to do inventory. And communion is a time, Paul says, that we look at ourselves. I keep telling y'all, in the old church, they used to judge other folks, sit the people they think that was bad in the back, and they would stand up in front with their white clothes on like they was all good and all in all. Let every man examine his own self and you then, if you examine yourself, you have an opportunity to come become conscious, to take an inventory of your life, your sin, your behaviors, and your issues. It reminds us that God has given us another chance to come back and say to him, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is a time for us not to be big eyes and little U's. It is a time for all of us to come back to the foot of the cross and remind ourselves that it's not by any goodness or righteousness of our own, but it's by the mercy of God. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Not my goodness. I know it was the blood saved me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. I know it was the blood saved me. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It was not my good works that got me here. I'm reminded that what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious tears that know, that make me white as snow. If God does not make
because white we have no ability. But I'm glad that he has learned and we are learning uh, that we don't let him have to find us in want. Uh, but we come to God. Uh, we come willingly and able. Uh, we come naked before him. Uh, we come before him knowing uh, that we stand in the need of his grace. Uh, and even when we are judged, we are disciplined. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you love me enough. Uh, that you did not let me go too far. Uh, thank you that when I fell short, uh, you were able to arrest me. Uh, you were able to bring me back. Uh, all of us have strayed away in times of our life. Uh, and many of us have sit right in the church and backslidden. Uh, you, all, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but after a while, the Holy Ghost, uh, somebody shout Holy Ghost. Uh, the Holy Ghost got a hold of you uh, and begin to convict you uh, because he never condemns you. He just challenges you. And because of his grace, aren't you glad he didn't let you go? Aren't you glad that he called you? Aren't you glad he arrested you? Aren't you glad he let you get into some trouble that would change your direction? Aren't you glad when you got in trouble you could say like David said, this poor man cried and he delivered me out of all my sin. That's what we shout about. We shout because he didn't let us go too far. Wave at somebody and say he didn't let me go too far. When I strayed away, he put his hand on me. When I strayed away, his rod it comforted me. When I strayed away, he didn't let me go. Shout glory in hell. He says if any man speak as the oracles of God, if any man minister, let him minister with the ability of God that all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And then he picks it up and he says, think it not strange when you go through the fiery trial because it is there to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice as partakers of Christ's suffering and when the glory shall be revealed, you'll be glad with exceedingly joy. He said, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, instead of you going somewhere hiding, when you are a mature saint, when the fire gets hot, your worship gets hotter. When you are a mature saint, when the enemy comes to try to destroy you, you bow down and you grab on the horns of the altar and you say, God, I'm going through, but I'm coming out better than I went in. Shout glory in you. He says, listen here on your end. Don't suffer because of your stupidity. Don't suffer because you became a, a cast away. Don't suffer because of stupid stuff you did. Stop being an evildoer. Don't suffer because you're a busybody. All up in somebody else's mess. This is not the suffering that qualifies you for the price. This is not the suffering that causes you to grow in God. For the time should come that judgment must begin in the house of God. What is he saying? He's saying if we don't self-check, we're going to find ourselves a food in the face of the world. It's time for us to do an inventory and say, Lord, the church is in trouble. Lord, the church is backslidden. Lord, the leaders don't lead no more. The ministers don't minister no more. Lord, the people have gone astray chasing out other gods because if we judge ourselves, we don't have to be judged by the world. I don't know about you, but I'm going to judge myself so that I don't have to fall a victim to the world. I'm going to judge myself so that I don't look like a castaway, so that I don't look like a fool, so that I'm not mocked by the powers of this world. The enemy is laughing at the church because we don't have sense enough to know the state that we're in.
know what the enemy doing? Laughing at us. You know what he's doing? He's sitting back with a box of popcorn. Looking at the church in its weakest condition. Y'all ain't going to talk to me today. I, I know, I know. They didn't want to hear Ezra either, but he, he still had to tell them. You, 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 you're you sitting here thinking you got it going on and you're so far from God. He said, when they think they are special, when they think they have fared sumptuously, when they think they are all of that in bag of chip, they are blind. And they recognize, they don't even recognize that they're naked, poor, and weak. We're living, don't you fool yourself, and don't you turn that channel. We're living in a day when the church should be ashamed. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. And the problem is, we ain't got sense enough to know we shame. It's one thing to be naked. It's another thing to look in the mirror and don't know you naked. The shame is... You can't even recognize your condition. So you have no conviction to fix what you don't even know is wrong. And we're living in a time we don't know right from wrong. We call it right, wrong, and wrong, right. Now we playing these church games. We making these excuses. We just lying to ourselves. But how many know there's one person you can't lie to? That's God. Play something softly as we get ready to go. Everybody's standing. You watching me online. This is a time that all of us have the courage We, we, we need the carriage. Paul said the word is like a mirror. And when you look in the mirror and you see the flaws that's there, don't ignore them. Who looks in the mirror and see a big sum in their nose and don't remove it? Paul said, but those that read my word and don't apply they're like a man who looks in the mirror and forget what he looked like. Don't take no, no attempt to fix it. Just keep on going. Just keep on riding. That's why this message is not for everybody. Because everybody ain't ready. I don't know when he's coming. Folk been saying he's been coming here since I was a child. But I do know this. I want to be ready. I want to be somewhere stupid and backslidden and out of my position and out of my place with God. I don't want to risk that. It's my job to stay vigilant, sober, consistent, and committed to what Christ has given me, knowing that he is about a good work in me. That's my job. You have to make a decision. You know, maybe you don't, but this is the day we need to find out where we stand. It's like Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? Who, who, who is going to stand with the Lord? Choice is ours. I'm speaking to somebody today. You're listening to me.
And some of you, listen to me, some of you said, I left the church because they play games. But baby, if you left the church because other folks are playing games, the only person that was really playing the game was you. Because if you was really serious about your relationship with God, you commit and you deal with it. You get through it. You grow from it. You learn from it and become better. If you're not saved today, today I'm afraid for backsliders. I just feel heavy. The day is a backslider day. This day is just, I don't do it every week, but the day is just a backslider day. But you know what? You can't come back from if you don't know you slid. You can't get back if you don't know where you left. I want to pray for you that don't know Christ. Father, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again. And I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart, not only to be Savior, but to be Lord of my life. As I yield my life to you, I give you permission to grow me into the woman, the man that you intended for me to be. In Jesus' name. Those of you that have backslidden, those of you that have all these excuses about why you can't be faithful to God, all of you that have little by little drifted away. It used to be a time where you were convicted not to be in the house of God. You were convicted not to be in front of your computer when church service was going on. But you know what? It's like a frog. Before he know it, the heat is too hot, he dead. And that's the way the enemy is doing. He's seducing you. He's trying to cause you to drift to the point of no return. But God sent me this morning to tell you, come back to him. He's still there, still waiting, arms open wide. He's like the father that was on the porch when the prodigal son returned. If you'll come back to him, get rid of those excuses, stop lying to yourself, and accept responsibility for the fact that you allowed this to happen. If you humble yourself and come back to God, everything God promised you, he's going to bring it to pass. Nothing will be lost and God will make up for the time you lost. But today you hear his voice, harden not your heart as they did in the day of provocation. God loves you so much that he sent somebody like me to say to you, it's time to come back. It's time to come back to God. It's time to resume your place of service. It's time to get back into a place of prayer. It's time to get back into a place of worship. It's time to get back to a place of your Bible study. It's time for you to return to God. And God will return to you. Father, I pray for those hearts that are tender today. They lost their way, God. They got distracted. Things happened in their life. They got confused. They allowed things and issues and people to distract them and get in their way of their walk with you. But I pray for you, for them today, Lord, that they will know your grace and mercy. They, they will feel your hand. That They will feel your conviction. Not condemning them, but letting them know. You love them and you want this relationship with them renewed and restored and that the best is yet to come for them if they can only hear your voice and respond to you humbly. Father, I pray for them now that you would bless their families, touch their lives, move in their situations, deal with them in their difficulties, 
and give them the strength to overcome those things that may have hindered their walk with you. Lord, most of all, I pray that they would feel your love, your grace, and your mercy today. In Jesus' name. If you prayed those prayers with me, put it down in the chat.